we're going to be this morning. Uh, since I probably won't see you by Christmas, un unless the Lord sees fit for that to happen. I want to wish all of you a Merry Christmas. I also want to comment, because I'm a huge fan of real Christmas trees. You guys have a very beautiful Christmas tree here. And it's, uh, I, was, I was so encouraged when I came in and I saw the little branches at the bottom, which told me it was a real one. If it's not a real one, it's an awesome fake one, I can tell you that. <laughs> Uh, but it looks real, um, and uh, just a real beautiful decoration for the sanctuary, so great job on that one. Come down with me, please, to verse number 13. We're going to be talking this morning about the greatest confession in the Bible, and I'll admit to you, this is a message that I've preached before, uh, but it's one that I, I like to share it at churches because it's it's so, such a message that points to the greatest need in every church. And the greatest confessions in the Bible. If you would, we'll come down to Matthew 16, verse 13. Here Jesus is teaching at the coast of Caesarea Philippi. It says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. And that's ending our verse there in, in verse number 17. Can we go to the Lord in prayer before we go any further into the message this morning? Father, we thank you for the privilege of being together here on this Lord's Day. We thank you for the privilege of being alive on this earth. Lord, so many went to bed last night and didn't wake up this morning. So we're grateful that we're here and Lord, there's even wealthy men who have passed away and they had millions, if not billions of dollars and would have gladly paid it to have more time on this earth. But their time is over. And yet here we are today alive, something that somebody would have paid billions of dollars to have. And we have it here this morning for free. We thank you for your goodness and we thank you for the health that we enjoy. Yes, Lord, some of us may have some health struggles and things that aren't working exactly right with our bodies, but at the same time, we're still grateful that we're here. And I pray your touch upon all those who need your healing touch this morning. Certainly, we lift up Brother Rex, our dear friend, and I ask that you would touch him specially with his eyes, that he would be able to have his sight improved and be able to preach because we all know that's where his heart longs to be. We ask that you touch them in a special way. And be with all those that are here with special needs. There were already many needs that were mentioned this morning. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you be in the midst of all of them. And help us, even while you're working, to keep the faith and know that you are indeed at work. Because, Lord, you do attend to the prayers of your people. There is no promise that you attend to the prayers of those who don't know you until that first prayer the sinner's prayer of faith is uttered. But for your people, those who know you and love you, you are very much at work in our lives and, and doing things, so many things that we cannot even see. And I just pray that you would just encourage those who might be tempted to think this morning that you're not at work. Help them to realize that you are working on their behalf and doing things that they would not believe even if they could see it. We just thank you so much for being in our midst this morning. And thank you for every soul that has uh, given their most precious thing to this service, and that is their time. We ask your blessings now as we go through the service. And thank you for giving the message for your people this morning. All this we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 You know, I, I, I love this passage that we're... Uh, that we read to you this morning, not only because of what is being spoken, but where it was being spoken. This, this was in a place in Israel called Caesarea Philippi. And the reason why 
they gave that distinction is because there was a few different Caesareas, kind of like Bethlehem. You know, there's a prophecy in the Old Testament that said Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem Ephrata. And the reason why is because there were two Bethlehems. They wanted, God wanted to make sure we understood that he knew exactly which one of the two Jesus was going to be born at. And here at Caesarea Philippi was a place where they worshipped the, the false idol Pan or Pan. If you're from Johnston County, it's Pan, you know. And uh, in fact, that city, Caesarea Philippi, is actually called Banyas now today in Israel. If you go to Banyas, that's where Caesarea Philippi is. And it's actually one of the headwaters of the, of the rivers there, Jordan River there in, in, in Israel. And and there was this huge temple that was carved into this huge cliff, okay? And if you go there today, you still see uh, uh, little windows that are carved still today. And they had this cave that went back into this cliff. And this, this cave was actually literally called the gates of hell, all right? And they had their little fires in that cave as they worshipped this false idol. And there was animal sacrifices done to earn the favor of this false idol. And there were even some theologians who have researched it out and found that they also would throw infant babies into that fire as a sacrifice for, to their false idol, wanting to have pan or pawns favor upon their lives. And so here we see it's really important that Jesus makes this distinction here. In fact, later on, we didn't read it uh, this morning, but uh, later on, Jesus says that he is the rock upon which the church was founded, and because it's founded upon him, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I can only imagine as Jesus was teaching that sermon that morning that he just turned his arm and, and alluded to this literal gates of hell there at Caesarea Philippi that had been used for false worship. And again, I'm not saying that it was literally the place that entered into hell, but I'm saying that it was literally a place that they called the gates of hell in Jesus' day. But he says something really, really awesome to his disciples this, in this particular instant. He says, first of all, guys, what are you hearing about me? What are people saying about me? What are they saying? Who do they say that I am? And of course, the disciples chimed in and said, you know, some say you're John the Baptist risen from the dead, you know, because John by this time had already had his head chopped off because of his stand against the powers that be. As others said, some say you're Elias, and that's just the Greek translation of Elijah. In fact, if you have your Bible and a pen or a pencil, if that word Elias scares you, just put in parentheses, Elijah. So that way it won't scare you next time you run across that. And he said, others say that you're the prophet Jeremiah. That's the word Jeremiah there, the Greek translation. That, that's Jeremiah. And they had some other guesses. And they said, oh, one of the prophets. You know, so in other words, all these different apostles or all these different disciples are chiming in. And they're giving their opinion on, you know, this is what some people say. Well, then Jesus answered back to them what I think to be the most pressing question that he can ask anyone even today. And what he asked them is this. But whom say ye that I am? He said, okay, we've already had a case study on what they say. You know, they like to talk a lot, don't they? Amen. My challenge to you is don't be a part of the they. Okay, you know, I heard one lady say one time, everybody listen up because I'm only going to say this once. That way I can say I don't repeat gossip. <laughs> don't be part of the they, okay, because they talk a lot. We've already, Jesus said we've already had a case study on what they say. Now I just want to ask you, what do you say? Who am I to you? is what Jesus was saying to his disciples that day. And then, of course, Simon Peter chimes in, and normally whenever Simon Peter chimes in, the other disciples go, oh, dear. Because he was that kind of guy. If it came up in his mind, it came out of his mouth just as fast. You ever met anybody like that before? Amen or oh, me? <laughs> Help me, Lord, somebody says. Help me, Lord. <laughs> You know, one of the wisest things you can ever do as a Christian 
is install what I call the 30 second delay filter in your brain that whenever it comes to your mind, give it 30 seconds at least before it comes out your mouth and ask yourself, should I say this? Too many Christians don't have that talent yet. It's, but we're all a work in progress, amen? We sure are. But Simon Peter chimes in, and again, the disciples normally are like, oh, what is about to happen? But this time he got it right. He said, you know, this is a precious moment between Simon and his Lord. He says, you know, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And what he was sharing there, of course, a lot of people don't realize this, but Jesus Christ is not Jesus' name, okay? Jesus is his name. Christ is his title, okay? So Christ isn't his last name. Christ is the anointed Messiah. So when, when Peter here says, we believe that thou art the Christ, what he's saying is we believe that you're the anointed Messiah, the one that has been promised for centuries, if not millennia. We believe you're the one. And so Jesus said unto him, well, Peter goes on to say, not only are you the Christ, you're the son of the living God. And so Jesus says, of course, you're blessed for this, Simon, because flesh and blood cannot reveal these things. You, you've, you've received this from my heavenly Father, and, and, and it's still true today, isn't it? For anybody who comes to know Christ as Savior, the, that confession that, Lord, I know you are the Son of God. I know that you're the God sent Savior. I know that you came to die for my sins. Flesh and blood can't reveal that unto you. That's something that has to be given to you from above. But it is something that you have to act on, isn't it? Because sitting in church makes you just as much a Christian as sitting in a garage makes you a car. Right? Your parents being Christians will get you nowhere when it comes to going to heaven or going to hell. When you stand before God, the great judge, you can't say, but everybody in my family was saved. I, they can't get saved for you. You have to act on that revelation. Later on, Peter says this in John 6, verses 68 and 69. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. You know, Jesus was teaching a hard subject, and it was so difficult. It was so, it was so rough that there were disciples that were starting to leave him. And so he looks at his disciples in John 6, and he says, will you also leave? And Peter chimes in again. He says, Lord, where else can we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. And then he says, of course, we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. You know, I really love the Christmas season for so many reasons. I love the Christmas season most importantly because it does focus on Jesus. I love driving by the yards and seeing the nativity scenes, whether it's the, the uh, older ones that I remember when I was a kid that were the colored tall pieces of plastic with lights on the inside, you know. Or the newer ones that's the plywood cutouts, which ironically are probably as expensive, if not more so, than the ones that were nicer. But I like driving by and seeing nativity scenes all lit up. I like the attention that Jesus gets at Christmas. I love the, the, the sound of children's laughter. And children's laughter seems to be in abundance at Christmas time. Whether it's us parents or aunts, uncles, or, or just friends of the family where we always get to act silly around Christmas and get, getting them to laugh or it's the opening of presents or things like that. I, I will say that our family, the, the Shermans, we, we personally don't let uh, one fat guy with a white beard get a lot of attention because he steals it from the real reason. But I, I leave that up to your family. You know, that's one of those things that good people can disagree on, still hug each other and walk hand in hand in service to the Lord. You know, your family says, well, we make a big deal of it. My dad even dresses up as the fella and comes and gives out presents. Fine. Here, let's shake hands. We'll still walk together hand in hand in service to the Lord. 
Another family says, well, we don't give him any place at all because he's just a, well, just in case there's younger ears, you know what I'm saying. Fine, whatever your family feels convicted about, then you let that be that. But I will caution you, anytime God has a special event on the calendar, Satan likes to make a counterfeit. And I'll just leave that at that and let you do with your family as the Lord leads you. But it is something that good people can disagree on and still be friends and brothers and sisters in Christ. Can we agree with that? Okay. I, I sure would hate something like that to, to cause discord in the family of God. Hey, no big deal. If you want to teach them that, that's your business. If you want to teach them about a furry bunny who lays Easter eggs, that's your business. Never seen that happen yet, have you? I've seen what bunnies lay, but it isn't very nice. My wife's probably shaking her head right now. And of course, there are those who don't like Christmas at all because of how commercialized it's become. And for those, I'm, I would personally agree with you. Christmas 150 years ago looked a lot different, don't you think? It was probably hand-carved toys around a Christmas tree and a lot more of Jesus and a less more of what we see today. But nonetheless, I love the Christmas season because it brings attention to the Lord. And, and he's done so much for us throughout the course of all of human history. I mean, look at all the lives he's transformed. Look at all the families that Christ has turned around. Think, think about all the dads that have been saved that before they met Christ, their kids really dreaded them coming home because just don't know what we're going to get today. And then after dad gets saved, he turns into a new creature in Christ. And those kids love their daddy and give him a great big hug. And he gives them a great big hug every time he sees them. And unfortunately, there's been some families that Christ could have done that, but their dad was too hard-headed. And like I tell the kids at our academy, at, Christ, at Pathway Christian Academy, I don't ever turn kids against their parents. But I do tell them their kids aren't perfect. And I tell them if there's anything that just grates your nerves and, and, and just makes you think, I'm never going to do that to my kids, then mark that down somewhere special and keep it. And make a promise to yourself and your kids to come that you never will do that. Because I'll tell you what normally happens. And if I'm stepping on toes this morning, I'm aiming for hearts, okay? What normally happens is that kids grow up to be exactly what they hated in their parents. Amen or oh me. I'm never going to drink alcohol. That mess turned my daddy into a, a terrible man. And then they become an adult and are addicted to the same stuff. And treat their kids the same way. I didn't like hanging out with my mom when I was a kid because all she did was fuss. Man, I tell you, as soon as I walked in the door, yap, yap, yap. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I heard some amens. I wasn't fishing for amens, but I heard some. And then wouldn't you know it, that's exactly the mom that they become to their kids. So I challenge you, mark down the things that irk your nerves about your parents, because we're not perfect. And promise yourself that I'm going to do better. My mom, she would tell me stories. She's still alive, thankfully. My dad's passed away, but my mom would tell me stories of how her mom would spank her with anything she could get her hands on. A wire hanger, a, a, a hairbrush. And so she decided I wasn't going to do that. So what did she do for me and my sister? She had a one-by-four cut into a paddle. <laughs> At least there wasn't a wire brush. But it was a board, Mom, thanks. Needless to say, I never got bored. <laughs> Dad joke alert. But, you know, it's just, just make sure you understand that the power of Jesus Christ transforms families. It transforms lives. And he has saved countless millions of people throughout the ages. And I love the fact that Christmas focuses in on our precious Lord. And, you know, throughout the Bible, there were many who came in contact with him, and they were completely transformed by their chance to meet him. And as they were in his presence, and they were receiving that transformation, their, their confessions have become famous. 
I think about all the confessions that we see in the Bible. There are plenty. I'll just name a few this morning. First of all, we have Simeon, the elderly man. If you remember him and the Christmas story of Luke chapter 2, you guys remember him? If you want to turn there, it's Luke 2.25. The Bible says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, basically waiting for the salvation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it says in verse 26 of Luke 2, And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. You think about how neat that promise was to receive. All right, Simeon, we see how much you look forward to seeing the salvation of Israel. We see how much you look forward to, uh, to seeing and laying eyes upon the, the Messiah who was to come. And, and truth be told, I personally believe that Simeon was a good enough student of the scriptures because anybody that was a student of the scriptures could have used Daniel's prophecy to count down the days that the Savior was to appear. Like literally, you could take the Daniel's 70 week prophecy that that was given in the book of Daniel and you could literally count the days and put them on a calendar forward and know the season in which the Savior was supposed to appear on the earth. And I think Simeon did that math and I think he's thinking to himself, you know, Lord, I'm getting kind of old and I'm getting kind of feeble, but I also know we're close to whenever your Savior is going to appear. I sure would like to live long enough to see it. And so one day God tapped him on the shoulder by the Holy Ghost and said, hey, guess what, Simeon? What, what's that, Lord? I'll make you a promise. You'll live long enough to see my Savior. And oh, what, what joy it brought to him that day as he received that promise. So then he, he, he needed to live uh, and, and, and just look forward to this day. And then, of course, if you'll go a little bit farther down in Luke 2, if you did turn there, you'll see he had a precious confession as he held the Lord in his arms. As you know, Joseph and Mary took Jesus up to the temple there and in verse 28 of Luke 2, it says, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. He goes on to say in verse 32, which is a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. I can almost imagine as that elderly man was holding God's salvation in his arms. Maybe a little warm tear trickled down his face. For I have finally seen thy salvation. What a precious confession that was. It's kind of hard to top, isn't it? But let's talk about another confession this morning. This one is one we've, we've went from Christ as a babe. Now we're going to transport to Christ on the cross. Yes, I'm talking about the confession of the thief. The thief on the cross in Luke 23, if you want to turn there. In Luke 23, because I think this is a really cool confession. And by the way, this thief on the cross had a lot of theology that he already knew. In fact, his confession on the cross is full of theology. But in Luke 23, if you come down to verse 39, if you remember... When Jesus was crucified, he was crucified between two thieves. The Bible calls them in verse 33, two malefactors. Anytime you see the word mal in any word, that is a Greek word that means bad. All right. If your computer has malware, what does that mean? You're in bad shape. All right. If you're suffering of malnutrition, what does that mean? You've got bad nutrition. Probably shouldn't eat that many M&Ms before you go to bed at night. Amen or oh me. But anytime you see the word mal, M-A-L, in front of a word, that automatically lets you know this is something bad. All right? And the Bible calls them malefactors, which means that they were some bad dudes. In fact, they had done something so bad that it was worthy of them being put on a cross and crucified. Some say they were thieves, some say they were murderers while they were thieves, but whatever they did, it was bad enough for the death penalty, okay? 
And so he was crucified between these two guys, and these men were vile criminals who committed terrible crimes, and their punishment was death. And while one of those criminals was spending his last few moments on this earth taunting Jesus and probably even calling out to the crowds in anger, it doesn't record that in the scriptures, but judging by his character or lack thereof, he probably was. And the only reason why he wanted to get wanted Jesus to, to show his power was to get them all off the cross, if you remember that. If you come down there in, into verse 39, it says, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. <laughs> He wasn't concerned about Jesus saving himself. He was hoping Jesus would save him so he could get off the cross and get back to no good on this earth. But something really strange was happening to the other criminal that was on the other side of Jesus. His heart was beginning to soften. And the more that he was around the Lord, the more that he began to truly believe everything that was said about him. And the more he was sorry for his life that he had lived upon this earth and the sins that he had committed. And he was touched by how Jesus was so gentle, even in his last moments upon the earth. After all, what did Jesus say from the, from the cross as everyone was railing at him and picking on him and spewing out hateful words towards him? Did he look down at them and says, I'll get you when I come back. No, he said, Father, please forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now imagine all of this, plus being arrested and having to hang around Jesus in a holding cell for a little while before the crucifixion. I imagine it all started to touch this man's heart in a special way. And as time went on, these truths were really beginning to do a number on this previously vile and likely violent man. And what happened next was something that only could be written in the Bible. This criminal, this violent thief, began to speak a heartfelt confession right there on the cross next to Jesus. While he couldn't reach out with his hands because, of course, they were nailed to the cross. This man reached out with the most important thing, and it was a cry from his heart. And hear the words of this malefactor today. First thing he did was he rebuked the awful actions of the sinful and selfish criminal who was trying to tempt Jesus into getting them off the cross. In verse 40 and 41, you see that the other answering rebuked that evil one saying dost thou not fear God seeing thou art in the same condemnation for we deserve this we indeed justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds but this man has done nothing amiss so first of all his buddy in crime has now turned into his enemy be quiet over there don't you know we deserve this but this man hasn't done anything wrong and then of course he openly confessed that he knew Jesus was completely and utterly innocent when he said, this man has done nothing amiss. And next he said something that has to go down as one of the greatest and the simplest confessions ever found in the Bible. If you'll look in verse 42, this, this thief, again we're in Luke 23, this thief looked at Jesus and said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And not only was this a sweet, heartfelt confession, this was rich in theology. First of all, he said, Lord. He called Jesus his Lord. And the only people who are willing to call Jesus Lord are the people who are willing to follow him. Amen. So he didn't just say Jesus, which would have just been his name. But he said, Lord, he was already willing at that point to surrender. Lord, I surrender to you. I follow you. By one word, he was already saying, I seek your help and your forgiveness. Then he goes on in that statement. Again, rich in theology. I wish I had more time to develop this. But this is literally a message all in itself. 
He says, Lord, remember me. Now, are you telling somebody who's about to die and you know that within 10 hours or less, maybe five hours or less, that they're going to be graveyard dead? Do you normally tell them to remember you? I mean, I, I know, of course, doctrinally speaking, the Bible teaches that men and women will remember whether they go to heaven or hell, they'll remember. And that the first thing that, uh, the, that Father Abraham told the rich man who died and ended up in hell, he said, son, remember. Isn't that what he said? You're going to remember all those times you said no to Jesus. You're going to remember all those times that the, your mother prayed for you. You're going to remember all of that. Son, remember. But somebody who's about to die, you don't normally tell them to remember you. Unless you believe they're going to come back from the dead. Right? Unless you believe they're going to come back from the dead. So this, this thief on the cross, not only did he say, Lord, as in I surrender to you, but he said, remember me, because I know you're coming back from the dead, and I know that you're special, and I know that if I can just get my name in wherever it is you call names, I'll be in good shape. And then he says something else that's pretty unique. He said, Lord, remember me. And what's the next part of his statement? When thou comest into thy kingdom. Isn't it so neat that that thief was looking at a bloodied, bruised, and battered shell of a man with a crown of thorns on his head and spikes through his hands and feet? He was looking at that. And he said, oh, I don't see a man crucified. I see a king. Isn't that wonderful? I see, not only do I see a king, I see my king. And on that day that he said that, the Lord responded in what is to be the most gracious response ever. The Lord said this, you haven't joined a church yet, son, sorry. Is that what Jesus said? Hold on, I got more. You haven't been baptized yet, son. Sorry. Is that what Jesus said? Oh, here's a good one. There's nothing that you can do for me, son. Sorry. Is that what Jesus said? So you mean to tell me Jesus saves by grace alone, without works, without baptism, without church membership? All those things are good, by the way. All those things are good. But do you mean Jesus still saves on somebody's deathbed even when they can't do anything else for him? He absolutely does. Because the king is gracious, isn't he? And he's our king too. And I hope that he's your king. So we see here, these are two very powerful confessions. One of an elderly man holding the babe in his arms and seeing God's salvation, which he was promised to see before he would die. The other hanging on the cross as a thief, dying for his own sins, but yet looking at the Savior who was ultimately dying for all the sins. And he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Two awesome confessions. But I got to tell you right now, they're not even the greatest confession in the Bible. Turn to Romans 10 for me. I hope I've left you hanging a little bit. Because I want to share with you this morning the greatest confession in the Bible. In Romans 10. Come down with me to verse number 9. Here's what the Bible says. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. And believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. <laughs> All those other confessions are out in the, in the ethereal. They're, they're out in Bible land. But I'm here to tell you this morning that there's a confession you can have that will impact your world. And the greatest confession in the Bible is yours. 
Because everything that was done, it was done for you. Jesus died on the cross for you. He left heaven, which is that place we so long to go to. I can't believe anybody would leave heaven. There's even been some pastors who said the reason Jesus cried whenever he went to raise Lazarus is because he was asking a man who'd been in heaven for four days to come back. Would you have done that? I think Lazarus was up in heaven and said, Lord, I think you got somebody else's number. I'm good. I think you got the wrong number. We're just having a grand old time up here. What? I'm sorry. You say, I got to go back? But you know what? Everything that was done was done for you. All those other confessions really don't matter much, do they? If you end up spending eternity in hell. Simeon, Simeon's in heaven. Peter's in heaven. We believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That thief was guaranteed by Jesus himself that he'd be in heaven that day. Verily I say unto thee, you'll be with me today in paradise. But my question for you is, will you be there? Because it doesn't matter about those other confessions if you've yet to make yours. What a waste of effort that God has gone through that you should die lost and apart from the blessings of God through Jesus Christ. I want you to understand that if you were the only person on earth, he still would have died for you. And he wants you to be saved. Not only that, but your loving family who are Christians want you to be saved. And your loving pastor and his dear wife who, 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 who yearn and pray for the day that you walk down this aisle and surrender your life to Jesus. They want you to be saved. Because truly the only way that a family can spend forever together is through the blood of Jesus Christ. I've always told parents the greatest gift you'll ever give your children is to be saved. Because that day when they stand by your casket and they close that lid and the last time they ever lay eyes on you down here, they know in their heart of hearts they'll see you again one day. What a blessing. What a gift. Christ desires to share his gift of forgiveness and eternal life with you. And that's why he was pressing the disciples in Caesarea that day. He knew, hey, yeah, it's, it's okay to find out what they are saying about me, sure. I mean, I don't want to go around with them saying I'm a fruit loop, you know. It's nice to know what they say, but I need to know what do you say. What do you say is what Jesus said to the disciples what do you know in your heart of hearts about me? Who am I to you? And so that's my question on behalf of my Lord to you today. Who do you say that he is? Are you like that wicked thief who only wishes for Jesus to get you out of a jam so you could go back to living the evil life that you were living before? Are you like the penitent thief? who has finally come around, I would say just in the nick of time, amen? Who's finally come around and realized that he is in need of a Savior. And that Savior just so happened to be right next to him that day. But friends, the same is true here right now. The Word of God tells us where two or more are gathered in his name, that he'll be in the midst. There's a precious hymn. I haven't heard it sung in years. But it says, Our Lord is in the midst. You remember that song? Beautiful song. I wouldn't dare sing it to you because it'd get, destroy the mood here this morning. I said, Is there a cat screaming? I tell you. But I'm here to tell you right now. At Cornerstone Free Will Baptist Church in Walstenburg on December 4th, 2022, Jesus is right next to you. Because he says, if I be lifted up, 
I'll draw all men unto me. And it's time for you to make your confession. Mama's confession won't count. Grandma's won't count. Your dad who loved you more than life itself, who prayed for you till his dying day, those prayers right now, they're being answered, I'm sure, but they can't save you. You have to say your confession. And it has to be more than words rolling off the tongue. It has to be connected directly to your heart. Isn't that what the Bible says? Let's read Romans again. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in your what? In your heart. That God hath raised him from the dead. Isn't that what the thief said? I know God's going to raise you from the dead. I wouldn't ask you to remember me if I didn't. And hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. I close on this. Your confession is the greatest confession in the Bible. Amen? Because everything is done for naught if you won't take advantage. There's been a lot of fine people come before you. But that don't mean a thing if you'll ignore what Christ has done for you. You'll either plead the blood here or your answer for the blood there. And I know that God has been angry at men in the past. And I know that he has unleashed his fury on this earth more than once in our history. But I'm here to tell you right now, friends, you've not seen God mad until you stand before him guilty of the blood of his son. As the old saying goes, you ain't seen nothing yet. So go ahead and make it yours. Go ahead and say to that Savior born so long ago as a babe in the manger. It wasn't his first day on earth. He's from eternity past. But he left heaven and came down here born as a babe in a manger. Go ahead and say to that Son of God hanging on the cross saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Go ahead and say to the risen Lord who three days later arose from the dead victorious forevermore and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. Go ahead and say to him, Lord, I may not have much to offer, but whatsoever I have, it is yours. Please forgive me. Please save me. I confess openly, you are my Savior. And that, my friends, will be the greatest moment in your life. And it will be the greatest confession in the Bible. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Our Father, we thank you for your presence in this place this morning. We thank you for honoring your word and being in our midst. You are our most distinguished guest. You alone are worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. And Lord, as we were anticipating this opportunity to share the message this morning, we've been praying, Lord, give us souls. May there be someone here this morning who've never confessed Christ, maybe even up until this point have been violently against him. May this be the day. What a special gift to give at the Christmas season that we would give our hearts to you, that we would surrender our lives to you, and that we would make our confession to you, Lord, you are my Lord. Forgive me, save me, and remember me when you come into your kingdom. May that be the heart cry of anyone who is lost today. And may we as Christians be very much in the spirit of prayer this morning, at this moment. Because Lord, if there is anyone here that are lost, there certainly is a battle going on in that heart even as we speak. And Father, you would be victorious over the wicked one who would love for nothing more but that Every sinner end up in hell forevermore. 
but you graciously come to us and say, come to me. All you that are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Lord, we know it's only in you we find peace. It's only in you we find rest. And we can search for it in every other corner of this world and never find it. Save souls this morning. Revive Christians. Help us to look at this Christmas season with new eyes. Lord, you are our Lord. And we love you. And we thank you for all that you've done for us. Transform lives, I pray, by your mighty power. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. As we're standing together, heads bowed, eyes closed, our sister playing the hymn of invitation.